The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. The first sheet on the handout really, I forgot to give it to you last time. It's simply a, an argument that for every major ideology associated with the change of a city, there's a housing type which is generated as well. And this is a uh, just a little sketch of some of the work that we've done in the classes. London, Paris, Vienna, Barcelona, Sunnyside Gardens, and so on. Those who are you interested in architecture, that should be a help. There are not many cities which originated in the 19th century. Chicago is one of them, and probably the major one. What was the population of Chicago in 1830? Doesn't matter. <laughs> it was a few Indians living on a piece of land which connects the lake to the Mississippi River. And uh, Chicago, I think it'd be silly to ask you what Chicago means. It's an Indian name for something. Wild garlic. Cities have, many cities have an affection for nature in their names. Bang Ma Kok is, is the village of wild plum in Thailand. Mumba Devi is the goddess of fishermen. What is Boston? St. Botolph's town. St. Botolph is a god of fishermen, I think. Certainly, Boston comes from St. Botolph's town. Now, the extraordinary thing about Chicago is compared to the cases we've done up till now, number one, that it has no walls. Number two, it has no royalty. It has no invested aristocracy. What else doesn't it have? Yeah, no, you're right. You're right, absolutely right. Uh, the argument for Chicago has always been, or was primary, okay. Be why we're talking about these generalities. The second page on your handout is 100 years of building activity in Chicago, done by Homer Hoyt, the man who did the, did, did the vector theory of city form, which we dealt with a couple of weeks ago. This categorizes building activity in the city, and we'll go through it stage by stage. But it's remarkable that we can depict Chicago's history in terms of economic activity, whereas we haven't used that as an index for any of the other cases. Chicago is built by the, by the private sector. It has no city or such a weak and corrupt city government that Everything about Chicago in its 
19th century period certainly, was based on the primacy of the individual making his own way against all odds. Chicago is referred to as the city of wind, not because the wind blows there, but because of the hubris of its politicians and its salesmen. Wind refers to the air that's blown out of the mouth when you brag. In 1848, I'll go through this in more detail. In 1848, when the railroads crossed this country and made their major Midwestern stop in Chicago instead of St. Louis, would have been, which would have been a more direct route, this was all because of the bullshit of politicians. In 1893, when the Chicago World's Fair celebrated 400 years after Columbus, it should have gone to St. Louis, but it went to Chicago. Chicago is the only city in the world which built the first skyscrapers on sand. It's the first city in the world and the only city in the world which built a, an illegal subway system, 50 miles of illegal subway built by private development without the city knowing. Or if they know, they, they, they were submerged in bribes. I will go through all of these examples. So, we can characterize Chicago adequately in Park and Burgess's model of a concentric universe in which movement is outwards. To make it in Chicago, you need to emigrate. In use the immigration zone is the inner zone of transition and then you make it and you move outward. American cities are primarily immigrant cities as opposed to European cities. And this model, plus the ethos of Chicago, represents in more stunning detail this phenomenon. I was talking about Frank Lord Wright and one of his clients. His clients were new. There were people like the man who invented the zip. There were people willing to see technology as a possibility for advancement. People made enormous amounts of money just by being in Chicago. I'll go through some of the real estate transactions uh, in a few minutes. So the themes we can look at, and I'll try to give some examples of, are the city as an economic engine. The cycles produced through advancement and setbacks in economics has fascinated cycle theorists like Kondratiev and Kuznets and people of this kind. But nobody has yet been able to perfect it. If you perfected cycle theory, you'd be the wealthiest man in the world, I should think, or the wealthiest woman in, in the world. Um, but the free market system implies risk, and therefore a correct depiction of the way Chicago is built in the free enterprise system would suggest a diagram much like Hoyt's diagram. Secondly, the City and Nature. There's a wonderful book by William Cronin called Nature's Metropolis about Chicago. It's worth reading if you have nothing else to do, which is not likely. <laughs> but Nature's Metropolis is written by a man who was a professor at Yale and is now an 
I think in Wisconsin where he's from. He's an environmentalist and he depicts the natural state of Chicago and its regional hinterland and the transformations that occur. To me, nature, in Chicago was, uh, was something that could be improved upon, as everything else could be improved upon through man labor and intelligence, so nature could be improved upon. Nature could deal with the consequences of modernism. I mean, Louis Sullivan in Kindergarten Chats, his little book, Kindergarten Chats, Louis Sullivan was the, one of the great architects of the late 19th century in Chicago. He built the, tra he, he and his partner Adler did the transportation building in the Chicago World's Fair in 1893. But Sullivan, uh, when I show you his auditorium building, you will read in the toilets the notion that, no, no, sorry, forget it, I'm mixing the, mixing the ideas. You will see in his system of decoration an attempt to maintain an association with nat natural form, much like, like Otto Wagner in Vienna. Uh, these are hybrid people. Louis Sullivan was very angry at the neoclassical system of the Chicago World's Fair. He said it would set back America considerably. Um, we'll talk about the Chicago World's Fair later in the class. Let's look at some of the other themes. <coughs> the distinction between the activity of the private sector and the weakness of the communal environment. After the Great Fire of 1871, there were two responses. The one was, gee whiz, what an opportunity to rebuild Chicago anew. The other one was, we are guilty because we blasphemed God. Two positions expressed by optimists. There was the day after the fire, there was a, you'll see, a real estate booth in the ashes. Uh, selling land. You get perhaps the starkest interpretation of this theme in the book The Devil and the White City by Eric Larson, another book that you need to know about if you want to know about Chicago. Yeah, up to 200 women, young women, are killed by a sociopath in his hotel, up to 200. Who knows whether it's 200? Nobody ever f look, was able to account for the number of bodies that he either put into acid vats or burnt. Uh, these women just disappeared. There was no police to, to account for who. 27 million people visited Chicago for the six months that the fair ran. Women just disappeared. The only way in which homes with a sociopath was discovered was because of a private security insurance man in Philadelphia, a man named Gaia, started tracing what was happening in, in these deaths in some of the deaths that were reported to him. The Chicago city and the Chicago police were ineffable. So you have this extraordinary view of the dark side of an environment at the same time as progress is next to what Burnham called the white city. 
as opposed to the dark city. The white city was this new Chicago World's Fair. It had its dark side as well, the Midway Plaisance. But the fact that in a city as late as 1893, in Chicago's case it was late, it was almost a century after it was formed, 70 years. Uh, we could have uh, the private sector maintaining technology, astounding technological process. I will show you a diagram which compares the Ferris wheel built by a young engineer from Pittsburgh for the Chicago World's Fair. For the first time, the public could circulate above the level of a city and see it. This was more astonishing than the Eiffel Tower four years before, and perhaps even more astonishing than Tutlin's monument to the Third International. This is the city which again defies logic by building skyscrapers without foundations. Well, the foundations are rafts which float on the sand rather than columns. There's no rock. This is the last place in the world where you would expect the genesis of the skyscraper. Uh, and the first tall building I mean, Otis invented the elevator, the safety elevator, before that elevators have been used since Roman times. But the safety elevator means that the elevator, if it breaks, has a cable system which protects the fall. Uh, the first skyscraper is probably the uh, I will get to that. I don't want to we'll detail all of these things as we go along. The Chicago World's Fair was stolen from St. Louis. St. Louis got the 1904 Olympic Games, the first one held in the United States, and the first one, the one, uh, second one in, of modern times. The first one was 1900 in Paris. Uh, the Chicago World's Fair has a number of extraordinary things attached to it. The one is the, the building of the grandest environment ever seen in this country. The manufacturer's building could house St. Peter's and Paul, the pyramids, the lot in one building. It was massive, it's extraordinary. At the same time, it had a branch, a road of 600 feet wide, called the Midway, where the vulgar aspects of honky-tonk American culture could be associated with. I'll briefly talk about the idea of the White City, the Reverend Moody's city, and Pullman, Illinois. Pullman, what is a Pullman car? As opposed to an ordinary railroad car. In a Pullman car is business class. There are black men dressed in black uniforms with white gloves, carry your bags, and elevate the conventional train system. 120 trains entered New Chicago as early as 1857 each day. Um, Pullman made a, built a new town at the entrance to the southern part of Chicago. You passed Pullman, Illinois, if you're 
came to Chicago for the Chicago for the World's Fair by train. Pullman, like many utopianists, tried to produce a culturally superior environment for his workers. And lastly, we'll look at Burnham's 1909 plan and subsequent attempts to modify the grid. Okay. Back to the handout. The first peak, dated about 1830, is by the, by the building of a transportation connector, a canal, which connects. A hypothesis about Chicago was it connected the world's waterways, or could connect the world's waterways. From the Atlantic, you have the lakes, and a small piece of ground, and you have the widest river in the world. This is not a trivial opening. It never produced the effect that it was destined in the minds of investors to produce. There's no traffic which travels along this route. But it was a brilliant hypothesis which in 1830 enabled Chicago to take off. You can see the peak. The first boom in 1835 Land values increased by 150% in two years. A quote from a journalist, I have never seen a busier place than Chicago at the time of the arrival, my arrival. The streets were crowded with land speculators, hurrying from one sale to another. A Negro dressed in scarlet, bearing a scarlet flag, and riding a white horse with housing, housing of scarlet, oh, with housings of scarlet announced at the time of the sale. At every street corner, the crowd gathered behind him. The total land sales, in, according to Hoyt, in Chicago in 1830 were 168,000. In 1836, it was 10,500,000, over 60 times in six years. 1848, the canal was finished. Chicago was developing as an agricultural center, wheat and lumber, and the beginning of manufacturing. But it was a town, I quote, without pavement, sidewalks, sewers, gas lights, streetcars, or railroads. The second boom came with a decision to have a railroad pass through in 1848, the chief ultimate importance of the canal, the lake, traffic, and the plank woods, or plank roads, was that they gave Chicago sufficient advantage to attract the railroad, whose importance in making Chicago a great wholesaling and manufacturing center. In 1836, it took 30 days to get from Chicago to New York. In 1849, it took seven days. In 1852, it took 36 hours. The geo time construction between New York and the Midwest, when being reduced, 
amplified the centrality of Chicago in the Midwest. Um, the stump of 1857, over speculation in western lands, Michigan Southern stock dropped from $88 to $9. Europe's European demand for wheat and this 1871 Civil War meant Chicago kept economically after. The post war boom of 1860, 65 to 1871 <coughs> re established in Chicago's industrial base. By now, it, was, it had manufactured the largest meat packing industry the world had ever seen using a conveyor belt system, which Henry Ford, amongst others, appreciated and introduced into his automobile plants. 1871, the Great Fire, one of the greatest holocausts in history, the resurrection, either optimism or blame. 1878, the boom, improvement in the American economic condition. Steel frame, the first steel frame, skyscrapers. Home insurance building, 1884, steel frame, Le Baron the Menenoch building, 1881, 16 floors, and so on and so on. So, if you're going to build a city through private inter initiative, private investment, you're going to have to deal with the cycle of economic advancement and boom and depression. Chicago managed... You notice that in the European examples, post Engels, I spoke often about the condition of the poor. The condition of the poor was not an, an aspect of civic consciousness in the time that I'm talking about. You, if you went to Chicago, you made it. If you didn't make it, somehow or other you survived, either by crime or by some other kind of device. There was no social program. The city didn't exist as an arbiter of human condition. Human condition followed what the market produced. The fire of 1871. Parallel the fire of 1666 in London, similarly. I mentioned the illegal building of a 50-mile set of tunnels in, 18, in 1914. Earlier, the city in 1890 had given permission for private, develop, for tri private building owners to dig in their basements to provide the insertion of the telegraphic wire. The telegraphic cable was soon seen as a ruse for digging mud out of the basement of your building and connecting it. At times there was a train which carried mail, it deposited goods, in the basement of Carson Peary Scott and Montgomery Ward, the two biggest modern department stores at the time. It even at times produced ice for air conditioning. Uh, it became a transportation. Uh, 
How did the city, how did the businessmen deal with it? By bribes, of course. That was how all business was done. Also by telling lies. The Davidas claimed that they were only laying cable for a tele telephone company. They dug at night so people would not notice the amount of dirt being smuggled away from the sea. They found that the tunnels were almost 13 feet high. Part of this was that two people a day were being killed in the city by trains going through crowded crossings. But the, uh, this is the only example in modern history or even in any history of the illegitimate building of a major infrastructure system underneath a city. It's a wonderful story. It's, uh, there's a part of me which rejoices in the idea of building an illegal sub. <laughs> one, day one day waking up and finding that you have a subway system under your city. Nobody knew about it. <laughs> Nobody, no, there was no permission given. But why what? I think I've explained that the city was inevitable. The city didn't exist. Local government didn't. Local government was corrupt in the city. Chicago is known as the shock city. You could get away with murder, as many people did. The great murders in, in the history of Chicago are fiction. Not fiction, the reality, but have become fiction in American violence. The fact that human beings can do extraordinary things shouldn't surprise us. The building of the pyramids was as extraordinary, if not more extraordinary, uh, con an investment in human labor and guile and the illegal building of a subway system in Chicago. Anyway, the other advent in Chicago of significance was the attempt to extend buildings vertically. Chicago was hardly the place that one would expect this to happen. There was no rock, significant rock formation under the center of the city. You need at least that support system unless you can devise an alternative which was devised for floating buildings on platforms. In the Home Insurance Building in 1884 was the first building built out of a steel frame. Before that, all building was... By the way, I forgot to mention, in the 1830s, there was a man, not an Indian, an American white man, on a canoe in this, on the Chicago River, he invented something which transformed the building industry of the United States. Well, he devised a system for man manufacturing wooden housing by using a balloon frame system instead of a post and beam. A balloon frame system uses two by fours or two by tens, make them into panels, which become the sides of houses, as opposed to the historic system of erecting posts and then spanning space with beams. This man revolutionized the construction of housing and he's 
little known should be known more widely because since then the per pervasive building of single family wood construction has manifested itself as a major economic force in the United States. Now we're back to the skyscraper. Under 20 floors of height, a skyscraper, a tall building, nearly needs to worry about its own weight and to a small extent about wind. Above 20 floors, wind becomes the major factor in the construction resistance that you provide to the wind. These buildings were all under 20 floors. Frank Lloyd Wright proposed a building a mile high. What was he thinking about? What did he have in mind? He wasn't a foolish man. I'm not quite sure I know, nor do I know that anybody knows. The Mile High Building at that time would have been so outside of a, any technical calculation system. Uh, in fact, the fact that you may be able to wrap a city in one building is interesting. The John Hancock Building in Chicago who knows Chicago well? Do you know the John Hancock building? The John Hancock building, except for industry, has all the artifacts of a city in one building. It has parking, shopping, offices, and housing. Accomplishing this one in Chicago, much later than Frank to write, perhaps suggests a model that he had in mind for building a Usonian utopia vertically. Frank Lloyd Wright built a small office building in, in Oklahoma. What was the uniqueness of his building, small building in Oklahoma? Do you know? It's the only office building at its time, that it had offices and housing on the same floor. Yeah, the separation is vertical. Better watch out for the time, there's a long. Chicago is a long and interesting convoluted story. I'm trying to untangle it. I'd rather leave this out, but uh, The question as to whether land speculation in the form of a grid is a vehicle of capitalism is arguable. I've written disagreeing with Mumford and Richard Sennett, two formidable opponents, on this premise. Mumford, for instance, says 
resurgent capitalism treats the individual lot and the block, the street and the avenue as abstract units for buying and selling. The rectangular street and block system projected indefinitely toward the horizon was the first universal expression of capitalistic fantasies. Each lot being of uniform shape became a unit like a coin capable of ready appraisal and exchange. Yeah, that means you can buy a piece of land in Florida without seeing it. I suppose that is possible, but whether the grid system reducing the complexity of investment to a unit is all that goes on. What about Sardar's plan? Here's a man who made an infinite, the largest housing environment in the world, history, by using a 113 meter by 113 square block system with infinite variables in it, not built, but according to him, to his plan. Is that a capitalism? Is that the result of capitalism? The other example, the largest, one of the largest buildings of mass housing is in Soweto in South Africa. Nothing to do with the market at all. It's built by a white government enforcing its power on a, on. Why well, it makes me think of James C. Scott and Arthur Smith. States want to simplify things. And I mean, how capitalism uses those simple things. Yeah, I, I think it's right. Capitalism does. Yeah. If I buy an IBM share, I'm buying one hundred thousandth of its typewriters and a hundred thousandth of its elevators and so on. Yes, of course, that's understandable. But whether in a city, a grid system adjacent to a river is a grid di different from a grid system adjacent to a mountain. There are natural deformations and it's not as easy to... What Mumford is saying is that in the case of Chicago, there was no care given to the modulation of the size of blocks to who developed where and how and so on. He's in fact saying that the free enterprise system has invaded the spatial property of a complex city and reduced it to barrenness. It's an intriguing proposition which I've... You know, Boston doesn't have a grid system. And there's been as much speculation in land in Boston as there've been in Chicago. So give me a break. It's those of you who are designers should stop thinking in terms of the geometry of things, in terms of simple outcomes. I, I think that's true in the long term, but in the in the short term, I know of like specific examples where. You know, a community can't get a grocery store because it's an old grid, you know, non-grid layout and grocery stores only want squares or rectangles. And so there you have, you know, it's not because of capitalism, but temporary or market norms, development norms relate to the grid. What about Manhattan? Yeah, it's not always true, but it's true in some cases. Yeah. I, I always get out of this by saying cities are more complicated than I know. <laughs> uh, there's a juxtaposition between the market and between capitalism and goodness of s outcomes. It's like saying the, Ameri the American Express introduced the traveler's check for the first time at the Chicago Exposition. And there were f new foods, sub things like fast food, and so on. Is capitalism to blame for producing these innovations? Was capitalism to blame for 
I don't know. I think it's a simple, when it, it strikes me as being too elementary. Uh, Richard Sennett, on the other hand, has another argument. I don't have time to go into it. I want to spend a few minutes on the World Sphere and then The World Sphere, in many respects, was fundamental in the history of Chicago and perhaps fundamentally in the history of the United States. The Crystal Palace, which is my favorite 19th century building, produced a slew of exhibitions in Paris. 1851, the Crystal Palace, 1855, 1868, 1889-1900. Five exhibitions between 1855 and 1900. They were all there to promote technology, newness, modernism, uh, and the market. There was no internet, obviously, the, the availability of information. There was no telephone. So this was almost back to Promethean, no, it's not Promethean, to Neanderthal times. So you needed these great events. The Crystal Palace had pieces of India in, as part of the exhibition. The Crystal Palace uh, genesis found its last major output in 1900, in the 1900 fair in Chicago, at least in Paris. But in 1893, seven years before Paris, this enormous task of building a mm, environment which would be so impressive, so capitalizing on the energy uh, that Chicago could generate. If a Chicago could build a skyscraper, at the time in 1893, there were already 20 skyscrapers in New York. They had the big department stores. They had mass, they had mass methods of producing meat and food. They had enormous grain towers on the water or next to the water. Um, the idea of having to make something which manifests itself. The second problem with an exhibition is that it only lasts a short time. It's of course an enormous advantage in that you can risk building a building which is more uh, likely to be thrilling and dangerous than any before. The story of the Ferris wheel is a fantastic story. Uh, there was a competition for a vertical element. The Eiffel Tower in 1889 had dramatized the idea of, a, of an exhibition. They, let me just draw this. Chicago faced the, the comp competition of the Eiffel Tower. In fact, the competition which was held produced may have fantastic entries. Jenison wanted to build a glass umbrella covering 193 acres, which is four times larger than St. Peter's. Proctor wanted to build a tower 1,150 feet high. 150 feet higher than Eiffel's Tower. The competition was considered a failure. Eiffel was contacted and asked whether he would come and do something as well. This was stark admission on the part of Chicago that anybody else in the world could do better. Somebody revived the idea of one of the entries in the competition by this young man, Ferris, who had proposed that you could
create a, a vertical system, in this case, I don't know what it's height. A system which could do what the Eiffel Tower and I may as well do Tatlin's Tower. It was never built. that you could create an environment which moved. Thirty-six cars. The engineering consequences of putting people into cars and then twisting them, twirling them around in the air was significant. No wonder the Ferris wheel was considered too dangerous. And they actually had to build a model of it. Well, not a model of it. They built it finally and tested it. And to everybody's surprise, but not to Ferris's surprise, it actually worked. It ran and provided a view of Chicago which people had never had. Uh, the Ferris wheel was located not in the main space of the exposition. A significant notion about the exhibition, it had the court of honor with these buildings on either side. You came in by train, connected to the water here yeah, through a gate. Secondary buildings along here, yeah, behind here. Yeah. At right angles to this, 600 meters, 600 feet in width, was something called the Midway. The Midway was first going to be headed by a man called Putnam, who was an anthropologist from Harvard University. He was going to use this environment to depict the, uh, the human species in anthropological terms. He was proposing building a model of a man and a woman based on extracting images of from 224 samples of Americans. I something crazy. All kinds of stuff. For some reason or other, the Burnham and his people decided that this was going to be boring <laughs> and stupid. So they hired, they brought in a man called Sol Bloom, who was a 25-year-old tw showman from San Francisco who'd mm, already produced shows which brought in Egyptian women from dancers from Egypt uh, and sold them to American audiences. Sol Bloom projected an environment in here which had Algerian Egyptian foreign in to the American pop, 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 population. And the Eiffel Tower was located here and not in here at all. So this was the white city. And this is the city of the, of the Octavio Paz says Americans go to Mexico to fulfill their 
uh, the, the, the deep recesses of depression, something of this kind. There's a wonderful piece written many years ago called The, uh, the Social Uses of the Slum, arguing that the slum provides illegal uh, advantages to people who live outside it and don't pay the costs of the people of the existence of the slum. So you get the idea that there are two sides to America. There's the side, there's the side of the establishment of the symbols of power. These buildings are bigger, the manufacturer's building is bigger than anything in history. The act, it's ax there's axiality, there's important ways of entering. And this is just as a road, next to which are the strangest things in the world. Not strange anthropologically, but strange entertainment-wise. Issues of sexism and racism clouded America at the time. In 1904, at the first Olympic Games in St. Louis, anthropologists wanted to measure, they wanted a day in which he wanted to measure why black men ran faster than white men. The Chinese I could quote you from the Chicago newspapers about the Chinese. Just assume that America was, had not liberated itself. This is pre-modern pre America. Had not liberated itself from the crutches of There was a woman's building. This was the first time that a woman's, not the first time that a woman's building was built. A woman's was built, building was built in the, in the Philadelphia exhibition 20 years before. There's something interesting about the woman's building. It was a fairly large building designed by a 21-year-old woman. It was a kind of competition which 13 women entered. Only eight women had graduated from architecture schools between 78 and 93. They were Syracuse, Cooper Union, MIT. The competition was won by a 21-year-old MIT graduate called Sophie Hayden, H-A-Y-D-E-N. Sophie Hayden had a tough time she wanted to depict a modern environment for women. The people who were paying the money uh, in Chicago, the ladies wanted to have a, a decorative interior filled with all of the fashionable items that women had in their lives. Sophie Aden suffered a breakdown and uh, her story is well told in the book by Eric Larson. On the story of, the, of Holmes, the sociopaths, um, you have to read the book to get the nuances of this man's guile and man, how he managed to offer accommodation in his hotel to young women visiting the fair. If there was a black part opposite to the white city, it would be this. I quote from his book. This is after the police had investigated the problem. The earliest, er, earliest phase of the investigation began when the police, holding their flickering lanterns high, entered the hotel basement, a cavern of brick and timber 
measuring 50 feet by 165 feet. The discoveries came quickly, a, va a vat of acid with eight ribs and part of a skull settled at the bottom of mounds of quicklime, a large kiln, a, dis a dissection table steamed, stained with what seemed to be blood. They found surgical tools and chartered high heel shoes, bones, 18 ribs from the torso of a child, and so on and so on. You, the book is an intriguing examination of what disasters could befall a city which advocate, was advocating at the same time these kind of displays, not only for its... I mean, Americans had never seen anything as ordered as in this environment. In 1893, there are stories, there are, there are books of reports of letters written by grandmothers coming from, uh, from Idaho somewhere to the World's Fair entering the court of honor at night and being fainting because they'd never seen anything made by human beings quite that way. The uh, other story which I think is interesting is the story of Pullman, Illinois, the attempt to build a new town for workers to build these new railway cars. Um, it was an environment which much paternalism involved itself in. That is, to create an environment in which the workers would have a higher level of culture and education as a result of living in this town. Pullman wouldn't allow people to purchase houses. Uh, he believed that they would become selfish and indulgent. He attempted to provide, he, he produced the Hotel Florence in the center with black waiters, a multi-purpose arcade containing the town's post office, the Pullman Loan and Savings Bank, the arcade theater, the library, and others. In fact, there's an element of the need to civilize people according to the norms of somebody, the owner. In Frank Lloyd Wright, in his projects for Broadacre City, talks about Beethoven being played in the street or wherever. Shakespeare in the upper part of the arcade was meant to appease these workers who couldn't have prostitutes who weren't allowed alcohol and were divorced and had to exchange the good life as destined by Pullman, who was making a lot of money out of them. Uh, the workers revolted and the National Guard was called in in 1894 and Pullman was destroyed. In 1909, Daniel Burnham, who was the architect and manager of the Columbian Exposition, was asked by the City Business Club, later become the City Planning Commission, to make a plan for Chicago. I will show you and discuss it when we look at the slides. I think let's leave time for l looking at these illustrations. There subsequently was a plan done by a German immigrant, Ludwig Hilbersheimer, in 1950 to, re to reconstruct the uh, grid system by shutting off, cutting off some of the grids. Maybe I didn't explain things fully enough. Is there anything in this series of sagas and hypotheses and stories and events that intrigues you that I haven't explained fully?
Now, okay. Well, then I've done a good job. <laughs> the wild garlic piece of land between the Lac de la Nile Noire and the Mississippi River is the genesis of the city of Chicago. Its history of development is best explained by Hoyt's analysis. Next. Here's the river and the first layout of blocks. That's a view of the town in 1845. Next. This is after the railroads. Next. A fire which, again, as in London, starts with ships and eliminates this large black area. <coughs> One of the major urban fires in history. Next. Through the flames and beyond, as it was and as it is, Wells and Company. Fire really post-fire real estate agent. Next. Chicago kept on spreading. This is 1893. Next. The Modern Dock Building, I think about 20 floors in height. The traction system for use in the media, in the meatpacking industry. Next. Some people argue that the French, the Parisian exhibitions, had to produce all the technology which wasn't available in the city itself. Some people have argued the Chicago World's Fair had all of these infrastructure already in existence in the city itself. Next. This is the auditorium, the toilets, or the ladies' toilets of the auditorium building. Here is a city, and this is a part of Louis Sullivan's decorative system. A city which is rough and haste and speeding along has another aspect to it. You could argue that cities should first make money and then reculture re themselves. But the first impulse has been argued in the third world economic environment. But first make cities for instance, uh, an alternative to Shandiga uh, was presented as a city of mud growing eventually into a city of gold. The image is that you, the important thing in the, is to establish the economic system, make it work, and then invest in the super, superficial aspects or the superior aspects of culture. Here, yeah, in, in a city in which there aren't proper streets, in which people get killed in the streets, get killed anywhere else, here is the cultural contribution. This is what the new middle class need to enjoy. Next. The part of the Colombian exhibition which involved the Court of Honor, major buildings on the flank, the electricity building, the mines building, or administration, the entry by train, the basin, 
the statue of the Republic, the harbor, and so on. Next. The woman's building. You can see the Midway Plaisance in the distance with the Eiffel Tower, sorry, Ferris wheel in position, as opposed to the neoclassical facades of the old part of the exhibition. Next. extraordinary historical devices, the crescent, the arch, the isolated sculpture. Next. Louis Sullivan and Adler's Med Transportation Building, whilst Sullivan rejected the neoclassicism of the worlds of this exhibition. He nevertheless had enough attraction to it to build this building. Uh, the administration building with a, a dome which is larger than the Capitol in, in Washington. Next. And sorry, I made a mistake. This is the woman's building by Sophie Hayden. In the interior of the woman's building, a mixture of new elec electrical equipment for the modern kitchen and half-nude women dressed up in drapery as the other half of the woman's life. Next. Ferris wheel, and you can see the Austrian, Austrian village, the Algerian, the Moorish palace, the street of Cairo, the German village, the Javanese village. Next, that's Sol Bloom. A little older than 25. Next. There's a kind of hybridity in looking at the history of cities. You could argue that almost any city in motion will produce hybrid versions of situations. We've had a hybrid version <coughs> of the independent woman on the one end dressed up as a nude model, on the other hand, percolating over a new toaster in the kitchen. The same with the American psyche. Uh, what do you go and see, the largest manufacturing building in the world, or come and enjoy yourself seeing the exotics of uh, Cairo Street? Next. It all ends fairly quickly with fires, one in the cold storage environment, another in the manufacturer's building. And this whole place is ruined and back to scratch next. Pullman, Illinois, the Florence Hotel on the right with the clock tower. Plan, typical plan of a industrial manufacturing town. Next, the arcade, perhaps one of the earliest shopping centers in the United States. Next, 1894, the workers and the national militia are called out to protect Pullman. Next. Burnham on the extreme left at the City Business Club and his plan to create a girdle around the city six miles out and to diagonalize the grid 
we are possible with diagonal systems leading to a newly created central civic promenade and uh, a large cultural enterprise along the waterfront and the harbour. Next. Regionally, all the railroads would would follow the same pattern uh, entering the center of the city. The park system would be uh, greenery located in the linked attempt to linked linked system. Next. Burnham had large drawings of Paris, Hausmann, uh, Hausmann was a long time in advance, but neoclassical Paris was what Burnham was using as a model. Next. This is the German urbanist Hilbersheimer attempt to revise the grid system by cutting it into different systems, breaking it up in places, leaving it where it is in places, instituting a different grain in some places, and really revamping the whole system. He was also attracted by there is a tall office building and uh, residential towers as a proposition. Next. And the last of this is Mario Gondolsonas' book, The Urban Text, an attempt to take the grid and the river and to reframe it best I can put it. There's a set of steps that you take in reconstructing the deep structure of this grid and river into systems that look like that. Peter Eisenman used the system in studios at Harvard. If we have a chance at one of the next classes, I will show some of that work. It's a set of, it's based on the notion that you can dig deeply into the DNA of an environment, reconstruct it, and re-elementize it in a new way, which is that. I don't know what the hell it means. Uh, uh, it has no practical value. Uh, you should look at the book, The Urban Text, and decide on your own. I'll give you my opinion. Uh, Chicago is now considered as one of the greenest cities in the United States. What does that mean? Sorry? Uh, the green spaces are mostly private. Does it matter what they are? Certainly not as far as the environment, the air, and the and pollution is concerned. You privatized all the roofs of buildings and made them green. You'd have an enormous effect on the energy system output in a city. I just leave the, uh, if you want to, I'll give you the reference to the study which posits Chicago is the greenest city in the United States. It's largely the greening of the roofs of buildings.
Chicago can do anything. It's an example of a city as an artifact which manufactures reef, manufactures itself almost at will, just through a kind of sense of will. When that sense of will to so how much is it, how much of that wills that will gets lost once the city becomes institutionalized? A, a lot. You can't just run, you just can't bribe your way through. Yeah. No, absolutely. Chicago's a story is a story of free will. Mm -hmm. Anybody coming in from anywhere, making it, and behaving like an important person. Yeah, there's a sense of appreciation in the DNA that you show. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, <coughs> absolutely. The social cost of the free sector environment was slowly picked up as the country. I mean, this was a pretty piece. I was trying to think of the percentage of black people in this country who still live below the poverty line. I think 16%. Or fifty percent of the black population lived below the poverty line in, in two thousand and thirteen. This is from William jo Julius Jones's work at Harvard, and the statistics are borne out. This country has never caught up with the capacity to socialize poverty. It's assumed that Mitt Romney is a arch example of somebody who believes that the free market system will eventually produce enough social benefit to take care of the exaggerations of the market. I don't know what else to say, it's such a big generalization. We'll come into it later in this class. Uh, Certainly the European cities from Engels onwards faced <coughs> the, I mean the Communist Party never had any leverage in this country. The trade union movement in this country doesn't resemble the British trade union movement in any way at all. The British trade union movement educates its people in voting, for instance. American trade union movement is it's half of the American South doesn't involve the trade union anyway. And that's where most of the new automobile manufacturing plants are going. <laughs> <laughs>